Well, hello, everyone. I guess depending on who you're sitting next to, I'm either robbing you of the chance for a good conversation or relieving you the burden of uh, having to talk to them. So I don't know if I should apologize or, or say you're welcome. Um, I'm probably not going to talk 40 minutes. Uh, I guess I thought that's what originally I was going to do, but I really don't need that long. I'm going to make just four points. Um, and I'm sure some of them will seem obvious. Um, but it is a pretty broad audience. And I guess what I wanted to do was, um, I wanted to kind of get people thinking about how do we think about adaptation? Um, how do we organize our, our work and, and our investment in adaptation? And also kind of how do we talk about adaptation? And maybe that sounds a little funny, but I spent a lot of time talking to communities that are not the crop, you know, the, the core of the crop community, uh, crop science community. People from the climate change community who want to know basically what's going to happen to agriculture um, from the standpoint of figuring out how big of a deal is it, you know, what kind of impacts do we really need to worry about. People who are thinking about investing in agriculture, what do we really need to do in terms of adapting to climate change. Um, and I think in those situations, I found it very important to be clear um, about what we mean by adaptation and what we don't mean by adaptation. So, you know, this is borderlines on semantics, but I guess. You know, the, the older I get, the more um, of a stickler I, I get for these things. And I'll explain uh, this idea of an 80-20 approach, which is usually how I end up explaining it to, to sort of people who are not experts. Um, I, won't, I won't, I'll explain that at the end. Let's say, keep you, keep you waiting for that and paying attention. All right, so four points. Um, and the first point maybe um, is a, maybe the, some ways the simplest, but also the, I think the, potentially the most provocative or, or, you know, potentially wrong, let's say, which is that adaptation is not as easy as it sounds. And I think historically we've thought of farmers as being very adaptive and breeders as being very adaptive and agronomists as being very adaptive, and that's all true. But that's all true in the absence of climate change as well. And so the question with adaptation is really about... Um, how well do we reduce the impacts? And I'll, and I'll maybe explain that a bit more. So the IPCC and a lot of people um, define adaptation very specifically as something that reduces the impacts of climate change. Okay. Um, and I like this definition. I like it because from the community interested in what are, what's the big deal about climate change, what you really want to know is are we going to be able to do all sorts of adjustments that reduce the impacts of climate change? Okay. So it's a nice simple definition that is very much with respect to that original goal of understanding impacts um, for the purposes of thinking about mitigation in, in climate. It's a, it's a pretty narrow definition depend, uh, compared to a lot of what people use. So a lot of people just use anything that's good, we call adaptation, right? Especially if there's a big dollar sign associated with adaptation in terms of funds, we call that adaptation. Um, and I'll explain why, why that's a, potentially a problem. And I should also say that, and this figure here is out of the IPCC report I was involved with. So I, I figure if I'm going to pick on anyone, I should pick on myself, or at least a group of authors I was um, associated with. This, this is the literature of e estimates of adaptation. So we tried to take all the estimates in the literature of the effects of adaptation in an agricultural setting, many of written by people in this room, and plot them on a graph of um, temperature change in the study. And one thing you might be able to see um, is this dark line through the data. And basically, it, it doesn't intersect the y-axis at, at zero in terms of where it would be for zero temperature change. You can see most of these studies show pretty positive effects of adaptation, but they're showing them even in the absence of any climate change. So by the definition that I just gave you, um, you wouldn't be able to get this, right? The definition of being able to reduce impacts, if by definition your impacts are zero for a zero amount of climate change, there should be no adaptation. So what this says right off the bat is that most people are using different definitions of adaptation. And in particular, what people are using, and I don't, I don't expect you guys to, to be able to read this, but what people are doing essentially is going uh, from the current state of the system to some future climate, and kind of, if it's a more stressful climate, they're generally seeing yield declines. And then what people do is they invoke adjustments in the system. So farmers start growing something different. They, they start growing it differently. Um, there'll be all sorts of responses. And we're talking mainly about on-farm adaptations here, not so much the market-mediated uh, trade, trade effects and things like that. 
So what we were plotting on that last graph was really on-farm adaptations, the impacts of things like switching varieties and switching planting dates. And so when they invoke these things in the model, you go up in terms of yield up to this new point C here. And what models are really defining as adaptation is the difference between what you were achieving under the new climate without any adjustments and what you're achieving with adjustments. The problem is, of course, that those adjustments probably would have had some benefit in the current climate. Um, if you look at the types of things actually included, this is just a, a, a figure I don't expect you to be able to read, but it won't surprise you. It's things like planting dates, changes in cultivars, irrigation. Even fertilizer additions are often considered an adaptation in these studies. So you have a negative impact of climate change. How can we make up for it? We put on fertilizer. We put on irrigation. That's the, the rationale of a lot of these studies. The problem with this is that, as I said before, a lot of these things will, will help regardless of climate change. And it's not just the nitrogen fertilizers, which are kind of, in, in many systems, obvious, uh, obviously a benefit. But things like any sort of risk reduction technology, let's call drought-tolerant seed as one of these, these will be very effective in the current climate, um, especially when you consider that there's all sorts of farmer responses to risk-reducing technologies, both in terms of input investments, in terms of how they manage um, the field. And I'll show some examples of that in a second. Um, you combine that with the fact that not only are, do we know that a lot of these kind of risk reduction technologies do have these responses, but they have actually been responsible for a huge fraction of the amount of progress we've seen in agriculture. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Um, this is just a plot of the, the yield progress in different crops. If you look at maize, for example, okay, so one thing we know about maize, and you guys know this better than I do, is that maize progress has been really a combination of stress-tolerant seeds and intensive management, especially increased density of sowing. So if you look at, um, for example, historical yields of um, different varieties based on the year of release of the variety, we've seen huge progress under very dense plantings, but not very much progress under very sparse plantings. And again, this is reflecting the fact that as the new seeds became stress-tolerant, their big advantage was being grown it wasn't expressed until they were really grown in very dense environments. So it was the combination of these two things. The stress tolerance facilitated this big intensification in terms of um, increased density. Another one that's often invoked in these studies is longer maturing varieties to take advantage of the, of the increased thermal time, and also earlier sowing to take advantage of the, of the earlier frost, of last frost. But if you, again, if you look at historically, this has been another key driver of change. This is work out of um, Chris Kucharik at, at Wisconsin showing you that the average date and the, and the earliest date of planting has really declined over time in the last 20 years by a couple of weeks. And then on top of this, because, or associated with this, they've been going to longer maturing varieties. And this is very much a technology story. It's not necessarily a climate story, but the technology to get seeds in the field, as you all well know, has been improving. So again, this can actually explain a significant fraction of what we've already seen historically. So it's been having benefits, even though in this particular case, of maize in the U.S., we haven't seen huge trends in, in climate. So in terms of impacts of climate change, we haven't seen that much, but yet we still see these big shifts. Wheat, uh, maybe I'll go through this quickly for time, but wheat is another one where, as we look forward, we always talk about heat adaptation as being a really important strategy for dealing with climate impacts. But you have to step back and say, one, is heat adaptation, would, how beneficial would it be without climate change? And two, how much is it already sort of underlying a lot of the progress that we're seeing? Um, I'm not going to venture into the Northwest because you guys know that way too, too well for, for me. I'm going to talk a little bit about India, though. Um, if you look at India, it's well known, and this is just a plot of sowing date trials, well known that late sowing leads to low yields, and it's well known that that's because of heat exposure, and it's well known that a lot of farmers plant beyond the optimum date for wheat because they are trying to grow two crops. And so the harvest basically kicks them into the suboptimal sowing dates for wheat. This, this has been known for a very long time. Um, if you look at what's driving recent progress in wheat, we did this analysis with satellite data, that there's been big efforts by all sorts of people, um, some of in, in this room, to try to get technologies and get knowledge out there that, that facilitates earlier sowing of wheat to escape the heat. And that has been, in many places, successful. So this just shows you that in much of Haryana and Western UP, there's been a very significant trend towards earlier sowing to escape that heat. And if you actually look at the numbers in terms of how much area, how, how important is heat as a constraint, 
you can actually explain all of the yield progress in wheat over the last 15 years in India. So again, heat tolerance is not just a, a question of dealing with future impacts. It's a, it's a question of improving productivity in the current system. So maybe this is a bit hard to see, but this is sort of how I think about it conceptually, is that we have it all in our minds this, this idea of continued prog progress in productivity in agriculture. So what economists would call exogenous yield growth. And all of these, you should know that all of these models that look at integrated impacts of climate change or sort of the future of the agricultural economy have some sort of exogenous productivity growth in them. No, none of these models assume stagnation because that would be completely inconsistent with the historical record, right? Agriculture has been the, the benefit of, of, of a lot of progress. But if you, if you just call these things exogenous and forget about what's driving them, and then you impose some sort of climate impact on that exogenous trend, and, and you all know how to run the models to, uh, to get those types of impacts, and then you invoke adaptations, but these adaptations are completely, at least conceptually, divorced from what was driving that exogenous trend, there's a big risk that we are double counting all sorts of things, okay? So drought tolerant seeds, heat tolerant seeds, earlier sowing, longer maturing varieties, these are all a significant part of the exogenous trend, okay? And, and, and I, I feel it's important not to double count those things. And maybe it's not obvious yet why it's important not to double count. Maybe this all seems very academic, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll convince you otherwise. Um, okay, some models are telling us, if, depending on how you interpret the output, that adaptation should be pretty effective. I'm arguing that a lot of that effectiveness is sort of um, delusional in a sense that it's really double counting things that are already driving growth in agriculture that would have the same or roughly the same benefit in current climate. You can look at different ways uh, of looking at this empirically. It's very hard to really understand the impact that adaptation has empirically um, in agriculture. One thing we've done is we've looked, trying in the U.S., this is just a map of, of a study we did recently where we looked at stress conditions over time in different parts of the U.S. And the nice thing about the heterogeneity of the system is in every year you can pretty much find some pretty stressed regions, some unstressed regions. And you can track over time and basically see how is the difference between stressed and unstressed conditions changing over time. And if you were just to sort of naively think, well, we're getting more stress-tolerant seeds, you would expect that gap to narrow over time. But instead, what we see is that that gap is actually broadening. And again, it's the rational response of farmers to both the improved technology and also the changes in the risk uh, sharing or the risk uh, reduction mechanisms that we have with insurance, that actually the sensitivity to drought conditions, despite the fact that we have you know, all sorts of technology coming in, has been growing, which means that the, the sensitivity to adverse weather conditions is growing. Not because we're worse than we used to be in those conditions, but that we're so much better at the good conditions than we used to be. Another way of looking at this is if you compare long differences and short differences in terms of like comparing yield progress over 20-year time scales, we don't see any sort of ability for, for areas that have been exposed to very large or relatively large increases in, in uh, weather to do any better than you would have expected just based on weather shock. So this is a bit of a difficult concept for those who aren't maybe used to doing empirical work, but it's, it's another kind of line of evidence that adaptation, at least in the context of U.S. Um, maize, where we have a lot of good data, has not been reducing the impacts um, of adverse weather. Another study uh, in wheat in the U.S. was uh, published recently by Jesse Tack, and he was again finding, if anything, a uh, increase in the sensitivity, so these are more negative values. This is plotting the sensitivity to temperature of the wheat varieties and the wheat yields um, in farmers' fields. And it seems to be even increasing over time, or at least certainly not decreasing. And again, this may not say that the stress, stress tolerance of these crops are getting worse. They may well be getting better, but it's the, it's the system that we have to think about. All right, so the first point was that it's not as easy as it sounds, that we do a lot of double counting, and we got to be careful about that. Um, but then if you step back and say, who cares? Like, if it's a good thing, if, if stress tolerance is a good thing, and there's all this money for adaptation, who cares if we call it adaptation and we're working on the right things? And the ends justify the means, and, and there you have it. And in fact, you know, most adaptation efforts, if you look out there, the Green Climate Fund or whatever is out there in terms of funding ad adaptation, they're generally focused on things that it's hard to argue with in, in a sense that they're, they're beneficial, kind of welfare-improving things. Um, and so... That makes some sense. And we certainly don't want to neglect those things just because we're so worried about reducing climate impacts. That wouldn't make any sense at all. But I would, I would say that there's two risks in doing this, okay? So if you just sort of say that's all semantics, we just keep calling it and, and, and focusing on the things we're doing anyway, 
um, there's two big risks. One is that there is, as I said, a huge community of people really interested in the impacts on climate change. And if, and if they hear people in agriculture saying there's a lot we can do to adapt, the way they process that, and I've seen this, is, okay, then we don't have to do so much to avoid climate change. Even though all of you know that the more stress you're going to see from climate change, the harder it will be to do everything that we're doing. So that's one risk, and that's you know, a risk at the level of policy related to climate change. But I think the other risk is more internal to the community, which is that it doesn't force us to think hard enough about what do we actually need to do differently than what we were already doing. Okay, so if, we're, if we call anything good adaptation, and of course you're all working on good things, right? Well, you wouldn't be working on them if they weren't, if they weren't very worthwhile good things. Um, you just keep working on that. And that's good, but it's not enough. And it's not enough because we know that there are novel risks coming into play with climate change. Okay, so my argument is that an adaptation strategy should really try to balance the generic needs or the no regrets types of things. Um, I mean, it, it is hard to argue with no regrets. It's like, it's like apple pie, you know, everybody likes no regrets. That sounds so nice. But the fact is that I would balance that with a real focus on what's different about climate change. What would you not need to do if climate wasn't changing? And, and I think it's useful to distinguish those when you're thinking about both in the modeling world of trying to, you know, we're talking a lot this week about modeling and sort of designing experiments and trying to come up with estimates, but also in just in terms of thinking about research agendas and what, what are we focused on. So here I'm going to give an example for Australia, and maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll spend the bulk of my time on this because it, I, I spent some time in Australia recently. Um, the, for those of you, we, this was discussed in one of the sessions yesterday, but in, in Australia they... Um, you know, many of you know this, there's, there's lots of drought in Australia. There's been lots, a long history of thinking about G by E by M interactions because, you know, there's huge variability in the environment and the, and the system that you put in place may do very well or poorly depending on the particular realization. So they've done a ton of work on, on target environment characterization, okay? And what we were looking at in this particular study was looking at how does climate change affect sort of the main risks to agriculture in that area, and, and what's different about climate change from what you're already doing. So this, you, you really, in this, in this monitor, you don't have much hope of seeing. Let me just summarize it for you, is that it's getting warmer in Australia. That shouldn't surprise anyone here. It's getting warmer in most places. Um, but the other thing is that the projections for rainfall change are actually, in the, depending on the season, are, are differentially uncertain. So in the, in the summer season or the sorghum season, you see um, actually kind of ambiguous changes in rainfall projected. And because rainfall variability is so high in Australia, that doesn't mean that we know the changes are going to be zero. It just means that the changes are generally within variability. Um, in the winter, in the wheat season, though, we see projections for most of this region. This is in the northeastern part of Australia, most of the region to be um, decreasing in rainfall. So what we do is we, um, hopefully you can see these, we take these environment characterizations. So let me just explain this for those of you who are not used to looking at this like, like I was when I... Um, when I started my sabbatical there. So what they do is they basically try to group uh, environments into clusters. And it's, the clusters are defined based on the realization of drought stress as simulated by a crop model. So this is water stress experienced by the crop. This blue line up on top here for uh, sorghum is like a, a cluster that has very little stress, very little drought stress. Uh, this, this really steep line here that doesn't recover would be one that goes into deep water stress this, this y-axis is basically more stress is lower values here and doesn't recover. Then you have the mid-season stress where you do recover, and you've got sort of the late-season stress. And the point here is that each simulation, each individual site year is, is classified into one of these five groups, okay? Each location will have a mix depending on the year of these different drought environments. So what we did is we looked at these drought environments and the, their frequencies over a bunch of different sites and cropping systems, in current climate and then out into the future as CO2 is changing, as temperatures and rainfall are changing, as humidity is changing. Uh, and we did the same for wheat down here, okay? So those of you front in the room maybe will be able to see. Those in the back will just have to listen. Um, what you can see is if we're just considering temperature and rainfall changes, we see basically a, re a reduction in, in the no drought environments and an increase in the drought environments. In wheat, we see kind of the opposite. We see a reduction in the drought, uh, an increase in the no drought environments, and a reduction in the drought environments. The difference between these two are, are somewhat informative. Remember I said wheat is the season where rainfall is actually declining, but this is the one where we actually see the least 
in, in fact, a decrease in drought. And the reason is, this would be a good kind of exam question, actually. Um, not that I'm giving you exams, but I'm going back to students. Um, one is that the, ex the acceleration of phenology is much stronger for wheat than for sorghum, okay, given the temperatures that they're experiencing. So there's a lot of drought escape going on with wheat. The other one, though, is that the VPD, the, the, the effect of water, um, so the effect of temperature on the saturation pressure of the air is very nonlinear with temperature. And the sorghum being in the warmer season, a little bit of warming has a much bigger effect on the sort of evaporative demand of the atmosphere than in the wheat season. So for those reasons, you see basically a decline in, in the stress in, in wheat, an increase in sorghum. But if you add in CO2, and this probably won't surprise you, you, you reverse the effects in sorghum, you see declines in, in, um, in drought stress, basically increases in the low stress environments. And, um, inc and it's, it, with wheat, it actually has less of an effect CO2 because you're both increasing the growth rates and the water use efficiency. So the, the overall occurrence of drought stress doesn't change too much. You can see also how frequent, you know, how well distributed in some ways you, every site, this doesn't show every site, but is between no drought years and, and very severe drought years. Okay, so that's the story on, on drought. This is like the stress that they are used to thinking about. Now, what I was doing there was, was looking at heat, and we modified the model to look at, at issues of heat. I'll skip this, this graph here. Um, if you look at, uh, looking at the yield impacts associated with heat, so the way we model this is basically taking the difference between simulations where those heat effects, and in sorghum, what we're looking at particularly is the effects on grain set of high, very high temperatures. So you can run the model with them without those effects. Um, you can also run the drought simulations and compare them to if all places were not drought, not drought stressed. And by differencing those, you can assess basically the average impacts associated with different factors. And for drought, you can see drought being the dominant constraint right here, that the average losses in, in Australia for sorghum and for wheat, both are about 30% loss on average due to drought. But over time, as the climate shifts, you actually see that declining in the region. Now over here, you see the effects of heat, which start much more modestly than, than for, for drought. And that, you know, reflects the, the or that, that sort of explains why they're so focused on drought. But if you look at even just the effects of this flowering effects of heat, uh, depending on the variety, so these are for two different sort of a susceptible and a tolerant variety, you go from around 5% to up to 20% by the end of the century for this particular. So in the case of Australia, the implications were, you know, that the relative importance of heat to drought is, is rapidly changing. That drought is still the most important, but the high temperature effects, which you wouldn't really need to worry about in current climate that much, are quickly becoming much more important. Um, and then kind of related to that is the types of drought you're looking at. So if you think, those of you who work on drought know that not all droughts are the same, that the kind of strategy you would have for breeding, um, for selection, would really depend. And in this case, the droughts are shifting almost entirely from droughts occurring primarily associated with low soil moisture and, evap and high evaporative demand, but not the really hot temperatures where you really worry about other things going wrong, to situations where the drought is co-occurring with extreme heat and, and you need varieties that can, can deal with both of those. So that was just one example. We, you know, we've done other things trying to look at what are the novel risks and also the novel opportunities. Um, like in the U.S., for example, there's lots of opportunities, which, which uh, we can talk about in Q&A if you want. But I'm going to wrap up with my fourth point, which um, is, to, is kind of a plea to, to think hard about what risks are actually increasing most quickly in your particular you know, area of interest. And it's not going to be the same answer everywhere. This is something that, you know, I think the, the example of Australia, when we went into that study, I think most people were thinking, well, drought is the biggest risk, and it's, you know, we just went through a big drought. The rainfall is projected to decline. Temperatures are going up. Drought is going to be, you know, the thing we should continue to work on and should, should continue to call, you know, our priority for climate adaptation. Um, it really depends on the particulars of the region. So in the case of Australia, CO2 is going up fast enough. I mean, it's going up the same rate everywhere, but relative to the effects of, of VPD, relative to the effects of humidity where it's not changing much, um, it was changing uh, fast enough to compensate for that. But the U.S., for example, is a different story. In the U.S., where I've done a lot of work, the humidity declines and the temperature increases are such that they really outweigh the, in, at least in the Midwest, they outweigh the benefits of CO2. So in there, the drought stress um, is increasing. Heat stress is a pretty safe bet that everywhere heat stress is increasing, uh, 
you know, frost risk. Decreasing is not so simple in some places as actually increasing, Australia being one of those. Um, and let me just sort of finish with some specifics on this or some, I would say, common mistakes that I see, um, not, sort of not universal mistakes, but sort of, I would say, common things that people get tripped up on when thinking, when being consumers of the climate science, okay? So one thing is you'll often hear people say rainfall is completely uncertain and then they sort of throw up their hands. Well, I know I'm in a rainfall dominated system. You know, wet years are much better than, than dry years. If, if the models can't tell me whether rainfall is going to go up or down, what can I possibly say about, you know, which risks are getting bigger? There, therefore, people sort of retreat into this no regret strategy, right? So I'm going to argue that that's not a good strategy, especially in light of the fact that these rainfall uncertainties are not going to go away. Most of these rainfall uncertainties, most of the times you see these some projections going up, some projections going down, it's because they are all in different phases of natural variability, which we're not very good at predicting. It's not because some of them think that climate change is causing rainfall to go way up and others think climate change is causing rainfall to go way down. This is shown here in this IPCC figure. So the way that IPCC now, which is different than how they used to do it, the way they express uncertainty, which I think is much better now, whoops, is if it's agreed on a small effect, so if less than half of the models show significant changes relative to natural variability, then there's no marking. And this is the this is the map for basically the 2025, 2030 time frame. And it's, it's not that you can't see the markings from your seat. Well, maybe you couldn't if they were there, but it's that there are basically no markings on the system. There are very, very few places that we've seen statistically significant trends that we can associate with climate warming. And the projections basically don't show anywhere that there's, that there's differential trends from what you'd expect without climate change. It doesn't mean that rainfall couldn't change a lot. It just means that it's all within the scope of natural variability. Of course, we want to think about adapting to decadal variability as well, but that's very hard to predict, and, we'll, and we should also you know, think about what is predictable that's going on. If you look out further, you do see there are places which, which have lots of models giving robust changes, in, in the sense bigger than natural variability, but almost all of those places, the models are in agreement about the sign. So anywhere the models are showing very significant changes, they tend to be in agreement. Um, there are some exceptions, which are hard to see here. But if you look at the white areas, which are, I know are hard to see, but trust me, there's a few areas where there actually is some legitimate disagreement where some models are saying greenhouse gases are going to make rainfall go up, and other models are saying greenhouse gases are going to make rainfall go down. But it's a very, very small fraction. So waiting around for those issues to be resolved, first of all, it's not going to be that important because it's such a small fraction. And second of all, you're going to be waiting a long time because I think there's a lot of fundamental issues that are, that are underlying that. So number two, uh, in terms of thinking about what's actually relevant in your region, is the fact that dryness is affected by lots of things other than rainfall. Okay, And, and you guys know this, I'm just going to remind you, temperature is driving a lot of the changes in terms of saturation pressure of the air and how much evaporative demand there is, and humidity. So you all know temperature is going up, and there's lots of agreement about that. Hopefully that's not a, a surprise to you. But what may, may not be quite so obvious is that the climate model is, I mean, one thing that's kind of new in the climate science, at least as I understand it, is that there's a bit more consensus that relative humidity is declining. Okay, in the observations you can begin to see it, but the projections are increasingly showing that, and the physics of that is increasingly understood. So if you look, for example, in mid-century, and you look at a lot of the um, continental regions where we tend to grow rain-fed crops, whether it's the U.S. or Europe um, or, or much of Africa, the relative humidity is actually declining. And this is fundamentally related to the fact that the oceans are warming sl more slowly than the land, and a lot of the moisture in the air comes from the oceans. And if the oceans are warming more slowly, they're not going to be evaporating at the same rate as, um, as the land is heating up. So this combination of maybe insignificant but still, you know, still variation in rainfall but not huge, huge uh, trends combined with higher temperatures and, and reduced humidity mean that in a lot of places you're going to have increased aridity even if you don't understand the sign of rainfall change. Now the other element which I already mentioned is CO2. So in a lot of places CO2 is going to counteract all of these things. So when you think about what are the novel risks, if you want to move beyond sort of just heat extremes and dealing with the direct effects of heat, um, you have to take care. And it's not to say that anyone should pick up and abandon their drought research because drought is continuing to be you know, a big problem now. It's just that we should not, um, let, let me just say here, so this, this is just to sort of summarize the 80-20, which you probably figured out now, is that about 80%, I think, is do good 
business as usual type of research, but take 20%, just like Google does, like take one day a week and do try to think of those new ideas that wouldn't be needed um, otherwise. Um, and in doing this, I think we want to be careful not to, not to undersell sort of the importance of the business as usual, but not to overstate the ben their, their benefits in terms of adaptation. Because doing that really, um, I would say, as I said here, you, it basically, it's a reversal of this, I don't want to go off on too much tangents, but people oftentimes would sort of say farmers aren't dumb, they're going to adapt. But this farmers aren't dumb can be turned around and say, you know, they're going to capitalize on any new technologies, even without climate change. We should not be double counting this. And again, the risk of double counting it is really a perception that we send to the um, sort of to the rest of the world about about the resources needed to deal with climate change, the resources needed to be put into agriculture to really effectively deal with climate change. We want to be very realistic about what can be done in terms of adaptation. And, and by that, I mean in terms of coping with the, the impacts of climate change and reducing those impacts. All right, I actually don't know if that was, that was certainly less than 40 minutes. I don't know by how much, but um, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thanks. Yes, you can hear me? Okay. So we're supposed to uh, begin our next session now, but we're not going to do that. We're going to take questions for David for uh, and, and start this afternoon at 12.45. So uh, I've got the mic, and there's a question. Yeah, David. <clears throat> On the last point, um, since changes are a gradual thing and it happened for many, many years, things are going to be a moving target. The farmers are changing technology and taking advantage of what is available as they go and the weather changes as well. So we'll never get to the point where we're going to have really adaptive new technologies because they are already adapted because it was good today. You, you see my point? I th I think maybe there's there's a couple points in there maybe or or a couple of questions uh, to discuss. One is certainly that adaptation is a is a never ending process because we don't see sort of the horizon of of stabilizing of the climate system. So until that happens, we're going to continually have to adapt to what's happening or what we anticipate to happen. That's certainly true. Um, so that's sort of the perpetual notion of it. The gradual part of it, and we discussed this a bit yesterday in a session, is there's this idea that because processes, you know, like selection of breeding trials um, are going to be occurring outside where, you know, as the gradual changes occur, that the natural process will be to adapt. And that's, I think, you know, what, what people would like to believe because that would mean that, that they just keep doing business as usual and whatever is changing, they'll adapt to. I, I think that the empirical evidence is that Anytime you target a stress, you make faster progress than if you just rely on the environment, especially when you're targeting a stress that, you know, is still relatively not that common right now. And, and I think one of the big risks is that you kind of lose the genetic variation for the particular traits that you will need 10, 20 years from now because it's not being selected for now. And, and you know, flowering in sorghum is a good example where there's actually huge genetic variability in the flowering um, sensitivity of sorghum, but, you know, if through repeated selection, you sort of narrow that into the more susceptible varieties, that you, you know, you could easily lose that. So, uh, you know, you guys know this as well as I do, but my perception is that, like in the Drought Tolerant Maze for Africa program, that targeting the stress got a lot faster progress than just relying on the stress to, to be inherent in the, in the environments that you're testing in. David, I agree with your assessment that we need to distinguish between the uh, adaptation which are good anyhow now and the ones uh, which really relate to climate change. Can you give a couple or maybe three examples which are real adaptation to climate change and not just good for now? Yeah, yeah. So I was um, I was trying to give that a bit. So I would say that anything uh, that either you couldn't have done or you wouldn't have needed to have done. So. An example is of the couldn't have done is double cropping in a lot of places that you can start to go. 
towards two crops in the you know middle of the corn belt potentially, and that's um, I think that's the couldn't have done. The wouldn't have done is I think a lot of the heat stress um, issues of of dealing with with um, high temperatures. Now, as I said, you know maybe it's it feels like I'm saying two things at the same time because I'm saying like in India, heat stress is already such a constraint that any work on heat stress is going to have huge be productivity benefits right now, and that's true. But if you look at other places like, say, corn in the U.S., um, as much as we know that flowering can be damaged by really extreme temperatures during flowering, it's not a very common cause of, of yield loss relative to things like uh, water stress. And that's my reading of it, at least. So, so in terms of, you know, if you talk to the drought um, breeders, they're not selecting based off of, you know, susceptibility to damage during um, from, from really high VPD at, at the key period. So that would be something you wouldn't want to spend resources doing, but you'd have to. And the other one that in that category, which we chatted a bit about yesterday, is CO2 responsiveness. It's not obvious that we shouldn't be, you know, screening a lot more varieties under high CO2 to really make sure that we are capturing the, that genetic variability. Um, I don't mean to focus too much on genetics. For me, it's the simplest thing to think about, but I think a lot of agronomic changes as well are things that maybe um, maybe they make some sense now, but maybe they make twice as much sense in the future. You know, irrigation, I think, is, from my mind, going to make sense in a lot more places than it would have otherwise because of climate change. So that would be another example. Uh, David, that's actually to follow right on what you just said. Uh, when we look at all the climate change issues that are coming and the degree of variability, I think a critical question, and we've been discussing it for two days, is the role of genotypes, environment, and management to address adaptation. Um, there's quite a bit of work in the genotype work. I'm sure there always can be more. The environment is whatever it's going to come down to us. To me, the sense is management is the area that is most subject to policy changes, incentives, regulations, and disincentives that perhaps might give us more time flexibility to do things quickly, rapid response, as the genotype solutions may take two decades or three decades. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about the potential and the role of the management component, and particularly how that links into policy initiative changes. Um, yeah, it's a sensitive topic, I know. I think that I don't really disagree with anything you said. I think there's all sorts of really good reasons to, to focus on management. I think if you look at, you know, the effect of a little bit of water harvesting or, or residue retention or something on soil moisture compared to what a drought tolerant seed can do, for example, it often can, you know, do much better. Um, but I think on the genetic side, we have to sort of pay respect to the history of crop improvement, which is that it's nothing's easier than giving a farmer a new seed. And because of that, you know, all the things that can go wrong in trying to get a new management system have some risk associated with it. Um, in the 10 to 20 and 30 year horizon for genetics, I, you know, I've made that argument as well, but the fact is that um, 10 years goes by, you know, and then we're going to need something, right? Or, or we have been working on things for, you know, some things for 5 or 10 years. Like this C4 photosynthesis, when I see people say it's a 30 year project, I say that's true, but they've also been working on it for 15, 20 years. So maybe, maybe now they're saying it's a 40 year project, I don't know. So your point is, is, is right on. But I wouldn't go swing too far in the other direction, I guess, which I, you probably agree with. But thank, it's it's a it's always a good reminder, and I think um, yeah, there's no reason to pit the two against each other. There's a one up here. I haven't really thank offended you. anyone yet. I don't think I'm doing yeah. my job as a as a keynote. I, I'm wondering a little bit. Sometimes you know we we are trying to look at the, the little details, but we need to look at the food system, because eventually that has the demand uh, will change also. So we, uh, to me, it looks like we discussed like everything will continue except climate change. And maybe the need to have uh, a more tolerant varieties or resistant varieties. But I, I think that we need to invest a whole lot more, I think, in the whole food chain, in the whole value chain, because it, it, we know that we're losing 40%. We were throwing away 30% after retail. So on the one hand, we try to produce more, adapt to climate change. On the other side, we just like ignore it. We never talk about it. And I think that the, the, this, the money we should spend also on the other side, 
and uh, that's the one point. The other one is, you know, when you look at the landscape out here, and in many places, and the slide I showed and other people showed, you know, fields of corn or wheat, as far as you can see, I mean, that's probably not the way to go under a climate, uh, different climate. So where are the trees in this environment? Maybe smaller fields with, with uh, more strips, different crops. You know, we need to maybe change working on the microclimate side somehow also. But that's also very important. So when you look at the soil, um, it can, can affect the microclimate in the fields together with trees. So, you know, there's a lot of other things I think we need to do. And I'm, I'm somehow, frankly, get tired of all this, oh, the breeding, okay. We, we have worked for 20 years on drought tolerance and see what the results are. I mean, they're minimal. I think with that money, we could have done much, much more in other ways. Not saying that we should not do some of it, but we're still focused on this breeding all the time when actually uh, there are many, many other things we could do, I think. So I don't know where, where you stand on this. You know, I, I agree with part of that. I, I think there are many other things we can and need to do. I think any sort of integrated model will tell you that one or two things are not going to be enough. Um, again, I think the history is that we have made progress on these things, that they have been very effective. Even on drought tolerance, I think some of the new drought tolerant lines are, you know, are more promising than, than maybe some people would have, uh, would have guessed. But, I, you know, I, I think a lot of what you said are testable hypotheses in terms of these systems are more adapted than those systems, and we should, we should test those. And if those can be shown to be the case, then that's, then that's certainly fine. I think the bigger issue maybe is that a lot of people feel like climate change has, maybe I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of people feel like climate change has basically doubled or more the attention play, placed on uh, food security and, and crop improvement or whatever subset of food security you want to talk about. Um, and to some extent, that's true. I mean, if you look at the money going into the Green Climate Fund, it's a large amount relative to the current investments in food systems writ large. So there is a you know people resenting that and and wanting to not lose sight of the all the other changes that we need um and that's sort of the 80% i think and that i think we need to include all sorts of things but i don't want us to get stuck in this debate about my thing is more important than your thing and then and then sort of concede that yes these other things are are probably bigger than what the climate change adaptation funds are are focused on because that runs the risk of really missing some of these opportunities to, you know, to improve the, both the genetics and the agronomy and the systems or, or whatever aspect you want to improve. There are some things that we can really be doing to prepare. And I think if you had a, a huge heat wave in India next year, I mean, a huger than usual, uh, you could or could not have seeds that withstand it. And that's a big difference. So, you know, it's not one or the other, but I think, I think it's important to force ourselves and maybe this, again, reiterates sort of my reasoning behind always kind of splitting this off and say, yes, 80% and 20%, because I do want to acknowledge that there's that everything else. But we have to force ourselves to think hard about that 20%. Yeah, David, thank you. That was a really good talk. And I, I think it's really important to bring attention to this, this complexity that's there that many people have ignored in the past in terms of correctly attributing the analysis that they're doing to adaptation versus the business as usual. And we're doing this in, in AGMIP. We, we thought an awful lot about that same kind of thing, and it's, it's not easy. Uh, the thing about uh, adaptation also, it's complex, and you also raised that as well. And one of the other complexities that maybe you didn't touch on, and maybe Hans was getting at this a little bit, is that there are more actors involved in the adaptation business than just farmers who are doing this kind of thing. Of course, plant breeders are, are one, but also uh, infrastructure and policies that will, that will help build the infrastructure in, in the places where climate is changing and, and that now it will become favorable uh, to put an industry there. Uh, so this would be an industry investments as well as climate, I mean, uh, policy policies, and, and those seem to be things that we haven't done very well in the past in any of our analysis, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that uh, it's a good point. Um, 
I think everyone heard it, I won't repeat it, but I think um, it's hard from analysis standpoint, especially, you know, you, you got to not only be talking with economists, but doing things that economists aren't necessarily used to doing, which is sort of modeling the, the development of infrastructure associated with a new industry. Um, it is, I think, a, it's an area where conversations, for example, I'm going tomorrow to talk with Cargill. I mean, conversations with those kind of communities to figure out what are the decisions on the table for them that they're thinking about climate change and, and trying to inform that is is probably as or more important than making sure our models can do that. But but being aware that, yeah, there are going to be these what people would call transformations of the cropping systems going on. Um, and I think we should pursue those. I think we should also avoid, and again, maybe this is just a symptom of being surrounded a lot by either journalists or non-experts, but there is a symptom to look at that and say, okay, the, you know, that solves it. When in fact, that's kind of on the margins. And if the bulk of your systems are becoming more stressed, farmers are not going to all of a sudden abandon agriculture just because they're becoming a little more stressed. So it's, it's definitely an important component. Like there's lots of big gaps in, I think, the literature, and that's certainly one of them. So thank you very much for your talk. You made some, some really interesting and I think unique points. Um, one of, I, I agree that the stresses that are going to be imposed by climate change, many of those are stresses that are already part of the system that are going to be studied in any case, and they're, um, you don't want to double count them. That being said, are there, in fact, unique stresses uh, associated with climate change, for example, sea level rise, salinization of delta, and those impacts that might have on, say, rice production? that can be prior prioritized within this overall framework, or should they be prioritized? Do you have a, a, a sense of that? You say unique unique threats or unique risks? Sorry, unique risks that are not necessarily, um, that are more specific to climate, to climate change per se, such as the number of extreme events or the intensity of an event, or yeah. uh, rising sea levels, or some other aspect that doesn't necessarily overlap as much as some of the other stresses that have been been studied in the context of, of ag ad yeah. adaptation. Yeah, I mean, there's this overlap between future stresses and current stresses, and sometimes that overlap shrinks down to a very small small set. And, and if you're looking at, like, the risk due to, um, you know, a huge hurricane reaching a certain latitude, you know, that risk is basically zero now, and it goes to non-zero. Because it's coming from zero, generally those risks are not going to be worth prioritizing at a super high level. Um, at least that's been my my um, perception, I guess. But there are lots of risks that are probably non-zero right now, but we just haven't been unfortunate enough to experience them, and those risks are rising. And, you know, pandemics would be the example of that, um, both sort of human pandemics but but animal and crop, you know, diseases. Um, the effects on infrastructure from extreme events, you know, as having served on the IPCC, there was a kind of a long list of things that we don't know enough about, but that was definitely high on it um, in terms of transport. And um, I, I can't think of, I can't think of one thing that's growing so fast that is going from like zero to huge priority in, in sort of the time scale that we tend to think. But um, but it's a good question. I mean, I, I would have to think a bit more about that. And we can all think about it. Thank you, David, yep. for your excellent talk and Q&A.